Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast, and to a new episode looking at one of the most important figures in Spanish, European, and global 16th century history. King of Spain, Holy Roman Emperor, with a plethora of other titles, Charles V, also the first of Spain. In this episode, we'll talk about his origins, background, and early years, and how he became such a remarkable and reputed statesman. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you to please hit that subscribe button to make sure you never miss any new material from the podcast. Let us resume. It is very important when looking at how Charles managed to rule such a vast empire after 1519 to analyze the inheritance gained through his family. Born in Ghent in 1500, his grandfather, Maximilian I, was the head of the Habsburg family, ruling over the distant Central European territories. Charles's father was Archduke Philip, who in turn was the son of the Duchess Mary of Burgundy. Charles's mother, Joanna, was the third child of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon. The introduction of Desiderius Erasmus's work entitled The Education of a Christian Prince is a good indicator of how much power, wealth, and inheritance was placed upon the shoulders of Charles. Initially, Erasmus does not spare any superlatives to Charles or his family. He begins by saying, quote, To the most illustrious Prince Charles, grandson of the invincible Emperor Maximilian from Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam. Wisdom in itself is a wonderful matter, O Charles, greatest of princes, and no kind of wisdom is rated more excellent by Aristotle than that which teaches how to be a beneficent prince. Erasmus goes on to say directly to Charles, quote, But you noble Prince Charles are more blessed than Alexander the Great, and will we hope surpass him equally in wisdom too. He, for his part, had seized an immense empire, but not without bloodshed, nor was it destined to endure. You were born to a splendid empire, and are destined to inherit a splendid one still greater, so while... He had to expand great efforts on invasion. You will have perhaps to work to ensure that you can voluntarily hand over part of your dominions rather than seize more. You owe it to heaven that your empire came to you without the shedding of blood, and no one suffered for it. Your wisdom must now ensure that you must preserve it without bloodshed and at peace. And such is your good nature your honesty of mind, and your ability, such the upbringing you have had under the most high-minded teachers, and above all so many are the examples which you see around you from among your ancestors, that we all expect with confidence to see Charles one day perform what the world lately looked for from your father Philip, nor would he have disappointed public expectation had not death carried him off before his time. And so, although I knew that your highness had not need of any man's advice, least of all mine, I had the idea of setting forth the ideal of a perfect prince for the general good, but under your name, so that those who are brought up to rule great empires may learn the principles of government through you and take from you their example. This serves a double purpose. Under your name, this useful work will penetrate everywhere, and by these first fruits, I, who am already your servant, can give some kind of witness to my devotion to you. End quote. Erasmus goes on to say, quote, I am a theologian addressing a renowned and upright prince, Christians both of us, were I writing for an older prince, I might be perhaps be suspected by some people of adulation or impertinence. As it is, this small book is dedicated to one who, great as are the hopes he inspires, is still very young and invested with government, and so has not yet had the opportunity to do very much that in other princes is matter for praise or blame. Consequently, I am free of both suspicions, 
and cannot be thought to have had any purpose but the common good, which should be the sole aim both of kings and their friends and servants. Among the countless distinctions which under God you merit will win for you, it will be no small part of your reputation that Charles was a prince to whom a man need not hesitate to offer the picture of a true and upright Christian prince without any flattery, knowing that he would either gladly accept it as an excellent prince already or wisely imitate it as a young man always in search of self-improvement. Farewell, dated Basel around 1516. By this point, Charles was already invested with the government of the Netherlands in 1515. The education of a Christian prince by Erasmus of Rotterdam is a remarkable bit of writing which came roughly around the same time as Thomas More's Utopia and also at the time when Machiavelli wrote The Prince, which was to be published in 1532. In 1516, Charles became King of Spain. It was by Jure Matris, by the right of his mother, Joanna, who nominally was co-monarch but was imprisoned until her death. Charles became the first of Spain. Charles had spent nearly all of his childhood in Flanders, yet he would be entrusted with one of the most vast and diverse empires of that time. In 1519, January, Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I passed away. It was reported that in his last years, he was severely struggling with depression. Apart from a few hunting trips, there was not much of a relationship going on between Maximilian and Charles. An imperial election would follow, and though Charles as Maximilian's nephew was a favorite, there was the prospect of Francis I of France to become emperor, supported by the likes of Pope Leo X. An important role in Charles' election would be the Fugger family, one of the wealthiest and most influential families from Augsburg, Jakob Fugger, through his enterprises had lended Charles more than half a million gold florins. With Charles's election confirmed in 1519, the empire would see an influx of Spanish culture and military over the next century, extending all the way to the Thirty Years' War. There is a very famous quote attributed to him where he presumably said, quote, I speak Spanish to God, Italian to women, French to men, and German to my horse, end of quote. Spanish would represent religion, more specifically Catholicism, as the Reformation, a process which gave Charles huge problems throughout his reign, did not really infiltrate Spain. Italian was seen as the language of romance and elegance, of poetry and culture. French was a pillar language of diplomacy, a lingua franca at the time. The association of German with the horse, while initially seeming like a blunt comparison, made by a Spaniard born in Flanders, makes a lot more sense if we regard the horse as a war machine. And his reign from 1519 onwards would be rocked by turbulent wars within the empire caused by the emergence of Luther Protestantism in the 1520s, but also abroad with the situation deteriorating in Italy. We'll talk more about that in the next episode. Even by today's standards, it's Quite hard to comprehend how Charles was able to rule such a vast empire. There's the very famous list of titles that he held, which was Charles by the grace of God, Holy Roman Emperor, Forever August, King of Germany, King of Italy, King of all Spains, of Castile, Aragon, Leon, Navarra, Grenada, Toledo, Valencia, Galicia, Mallorca, Sevilla, Cordoba, Murcia, Jaén, Algarves, Algeciras, Gibraltar, the Canary Islands, King of Two Sicilies of Sardinia, Corsica, King of Jerusalem, King of the Western and Eastern Indies, Lord of the Islands and the Main Ocean Sea, Archduke of Austria, Duke of Burgundy, Brabant, Lorraine, Styria, Carinthia, Carniola, Limburg, Luxembourg, Gelderland, Neopatria, Württemberg, Landgrave of Alsace, Prince of Swabia, Asturia and Catalonia, Count of Flanders, Habsburg, Tyrol, Gorizia, Barcelona, Artois, Burgundy, Palatinate, Hainaut, Holland, 
Zeeland, Ferret, Kiburg, Namur, Roussillon, Cerdagne, Zutphen, Margrave of the Holy Roman Empire, Burgau, Oristano, and Gociano, Lord of Frisia, the Wendish Marsh, Pordenone, Biscay, Molin, Salins, Tripoli, and Mechelen. I apologize for any mispronunciations and that plethora of locations. Thank you for listening to this episode and introduction to a general history of Charles V, part of the broader series Monarchs and Rulers of the 16th Century Mediterranean. Please make sure you subscribe to never miss any new material from the podcast. Until the next time, wish you all to stay safe and all the best.